We're talking reef tank pollutants. Ever wonder what the effects of coral toxins, rusty gear, impurities and additives or salt mixes, trace element products, and environmental pollutants like the surrounding air or your hands have on your tank? How about even better, what to do so they have near zero effect on your tank? All that is coming up. Hi, I'm Ryan, and this is the 52SE Guide to Reefing. In the last two episodes, we covered the two biggest sources of pollutants in a marine tank, foods and tap water. This week, we take the same approach to all the other material pollutive sources in the tank. We start with the problem those pollutives pose for reefers, the solution for 80% of us, and then what to do if you're in the minority where an alternative solution is necessary. Today's pollution challenges are multifaceted, most of them accumulative and effects show up over time. Misdiagnosed 90% of the time. First one, corals, algae, dinoflagellates, and other organisms in the tank produce biochemicals or toxins and then release them into their environment to inhibit growth or survival of other nearby organisms and maintain that territory. In the ocean, those toxins rapidly dilute, often within inches of leaving the coral, but in a closed system like a reef tank, they just build up and stress out everything inside, sometimes making them more susceptible to other issues other times ending in direct mortalities. Second, most of us dose chemicals to the tank daily or weekly, which are marketed as beneficial to the tank, but only when formulated and used correctly. If they're overused or poorly designed, the beneficial elements that support or enhance biology become elemental pollution or poisons. Third, there are aerosolized or gas toxins in the air surrounding the tank that most of us never stop to consider, but get mixed in as the surface of the water tumbles or via the protein skimmer whisking the room's air and your tank water together. Fourth, whatever's on your hands gets mixed in as well. Lotions, hand soaps, laundry soaps, oils, fragrances, petroleum products, disinfectants, garden sprays, basically anything that you might have touched today. Fifth, all the gear in our tanks is made from plastics or metals that can release contaminants into the tank over time, most commonly when they get damaged, malfunction, or the seals fail. The results of this catastrophic, but also completely avoidable in a vast majority of cases. Okay, sounds heavy, but the solution is light and practices that many of us are already doing. The solution for 80% of us is just this. Select a clean additive system that addresses these issues. We use Triton on the 52SE tanks, but there are a few different additive approaches that we'll share today that meet the standards that we discussed today. Clean your pumps and gear biannually, do your 35% monthly, 10% weekly, or 1.5% daily water changes, run either carbon or ozone, and the resin like Purit in the case of an emergency. These proactive solutions done deliberately with a purpose will solve all of these challenges. The real value of this video is understand why the good practices that you're already doing are why you're successful. Don't stop doing them or they're inevitable outcomes. They just take a while to materialize. For everyone else, consider the value of initiating good practices, as well as what to do when you're part of the 20% that fall outside the general council and need to apply a full understanding of these topics to complex situations. Our first pollutant today refers to biological warfare, where some corals emit toxins to keep other corals away, polluting the tank. Biologists refer to this as the lelopathy, or the use of chemical compounds to suppress the growth of competitors. It's not limited to corals fighting each other. Algae can produce toxins that harm corals. Cyanobacteria can as well as single-celled microorganisms like dinoflagellates and diatoms. The reason allelopathy is in today's pollution video is the nature of these toxins is they're rapidly diluted into oblivion in the ocean. In the aquarium, they're just not. They build up and cause a whole host of issues that are often misidentified. Now, luckily, they're easy solutions. The use of activated carbon has been used extensively in a wide range of applications to absorb, ionically bind, or neutralize the polluted organic molecules like the toxins that these organisms use to fight each other. A proper relunding skimmer may help remove them, and ozone in that skimmer will oxidize them and help break them down. To give you an idea why this matters to reefers, I found a few articles, starting with one titled Chemical Rich Seaweed Poison Corals When Not Controlled by Herbivores. It states that 40 to 70% of common seaweeds cause bleaching and death of a coral tissue when in direct contact. For seaweeds that harm coral tissues, their lipid soluble extracts also produce rapid bleaching. Coral bleaching and mortality was limited to the areas in direct contact with these seaweeds or their extracts. So what they're saying is that a majority of algae can poison the coral with direct contact and probably why we often see that in the aquarium when algae grows near the corals, but also when they come in contact with the extracts from that algae, potentially explaining why people see major setbacks with their coral when they scrub all the algae off the rock and much of it gets lost in the tank, touches the coral, or decays and releases compounds into the tank. In this one called Allelopathic Effects on Macroalgae on Pacillopora Coral Larvae, they stated, we examine the effects of crude extracts of four macroalgal species on Pacillopora larvae under different exposure conditions. Larval mortality increased considerably with increasing concentrations of bryopsis. 
Many people have prolonged battles with bryopsis, and harming the corals now better understand the challenges that they face. Maybe also clear why corals can be stunted with the use of products like Reef HD, Reflux, or Fluconazole treatments to cause fairly rapid die-off of bryopsis, but also ask you to remove the carbon and turn off the skimmer for it to be effective. At least a logical contributing factor as to why most reefers use these solutions fairly safely, but others run into issues and the nuance of our actions come in. Bryopsis is hard to beat, so I'd gladly use reflux as an off-label treatment, but I also physically remove as much as possible by hand before dosing to get the toxins in the bryopsis algae out so they're in the trash rather than decaying the tank, and then certainly get that carbon and skimmer going immediately day three as they suggest. This is the same counsel for those who use products like Flatworm Exit. Flatworms are well known to contain toxins. Get as many as humanly possible out before treatment, after treatment, and they're all over the sand. Suck them out. Don't let them decay and then release those toxins. Another article considers another common challenge in reef tanks, cyanobacteria, which has visible, observable negative effects on many corals in marine aquaria. The study called Elevated Temperature and Allelopathy Impact Coral Recruitment. They start by stating that live cyanobacteria are also known to inhibit coral larval sediment on settlement substrata, but the mechanisms of inhibition are not known. They suggest that since cyanobacteria are prolific producers of secondary metabolites, we hypothesized that allelopathy is a potential mechanism of cyanobacterial competition with coral larvae. It shows to detest microcolon A on the coral because it's common in cyanobacteria. The net result of that is the aleopathic compound microcilian reduced total survival rates to less than 25%, total settlement to less than 10% of the larvae supplied in both temperature treatments. After exposure to the microcilin A, the larvae had 2.3 times upregulation of stress enzymes. This is somewhat reef nerdy confirmation for things we already know. Tanks with lots of cyano don't do well. Again, potentially why when products like red slime remover or chemicaline are used, most rid their tanks of cyano without any major issues. I've never had any issue using these solutions, but I also try to siphon out the bulk of the cyano before using these treatments. We also follow the directions and perform the water changes after. Related that both diatoms and dinos are known producers of aleopathic compounds within the prolific slimes they create in the tank. Jonathan has a great guide he posted on Reef to Reef called Dinoflagellate Identification Guide, where he shares a guide to identifying dinos as well as the severity of the toxins within each. However, the most common way coral warfare is talked about is within the corals themselves, and within that, the most common the toxins that soft corals produce. And countless studies. Effects of soft corals on coral recruitment. Preliminary evidence for directional aleopathic effects of the soft coral on secretorian coral recruitment. Competitive strategy of soft corals, aleopathic effects on selected corals. All coming to the same conclusion. These soft corals like Simularia inhibit the settlement of new corals, inhibit growth of juveniles, and can even cause mortalities in adults. Okay, net result of this is it sounds like everything in the tank is going to attack each other and we're all doomed, which of course isn't the case. However, we can embrace the fact that all kinds of organisms in the tank produce toxins and release them into the tank. It's a fact. How they affect each other and every coral in the tank is way beyond what we'll ever fully understand or accurately identify when a coral or some corals are stressed or occasionally dying. But it's kind of a moot point when a few bucks of activated carbon largely removes these toxins. A skimmer will reduce them and ozone will break them down. This is more about understanding why good practices produce good results, so we have the wisdom to continue to perform these actions or practices and understand the risks and what to look for if we don't. In terms of carbon, we just want most of the tank's water to come in contact with that carbon a handful of times a day. Nothing difficult. A small amount of carbon in a bag between the baffles of your sump might be enough. A small filter like the CJ Shark that passes water over that bag even better and easy to clean. A BRS reactor that forces water through the carbon, probably the best solution, the smaller version enough for most tanks. Ozone's an alternative to carbon. Rather than capture organics like carbon does, ozone oxidizes or breaks down the organic toxins so they're not as harmful. We only run ozone one hour at night and ORP controlled to stay below 400 on a recirculating skimmer with long contact times, but still passes most of the water through it more than once a day. Beyond ORP, the best way to evaluate how ozone's working in the tank is the white bucket test. Fill a white bucket from your tank. If the water's crystal clear blue, then the lack of organic yellowing molecules is a strong indication that the organic toxins are getting broke down adequately as well. The white bucket test works as well on carbon. Use it to figure out how often to change your carbon. We're using ozone on 52SC tanks simply because it works every day. We don't have to worry about changing out media or how long it'll last. Some reefers will choose to use both to back each other up as well as other minor benefits to each. I'd consider a skimmer more supportive to organic toxin removal than eliminative, 
but a skimmer that is capable of pulling a constant stream of gunk and set up right to do so will obviously do that better than most. The MaxSpec Air Aqua is what we used on the 52SE tanks. The DC recirculated design is the best and easiest that I've used. There's an ozone kit with some tubes needed to swap out to use the Ozotech generator. Next up, additives as pollutants. They're inevitable, but also avoidable challenges. There are three ways the major, minor, and trace element additives can pollute the tank, create a progressively deteriorating situation, and make our goal of an awesome reef tank harder to achieve. None of them the type of immediate poison where everything dies today, more so an unconscious path to hard to identify losses and setbacks over time. What today's understanding will do is help you avoid the all too common experience of my tank is flourishing, it seems like I'm doing everything right, and then for some reason the tank starts to go south, even though I haven't changed a thing. Small, regular additions of elemental pollutants is not the only cause of that, but it's one. Understanding them all is how we avoid them all. Elemental poisoning and cause is something very few reefers would correctly identify or even know that we should be looking for. Luckily, they're easy, common sense solutions. You just have to understand their value enough to actually do them consistently and not waver on their value. The solutions are founded upon the understanding of the effects of impurities and additives, unavoidably imbalanced formulations, and embracing the fact that a majority of the manufacturers formulated their products assuming that you would perform some amount of water changes. You'll see that the fewer the water changes, the narrower their tightrope becomes, the tank more dependent on testing for elemental pollutives, skill, or luck. With regular water changes, the tightrope becomes a path where testing is minimal and skill or luck are not as relevant. I think you'll agree once you understand the full scope of challenges and how we explore them. Starting with impurities in the additives. They're real, they're in all of them. Pure is a mythical creature or a desire that only exists in our minds. Every additive will have impurities and some of them are toxic, but near never in a single dose. It's the 365 doses, 730 or 1000 months to years of dosing where they build up in the water or bioaccumulate in the coral's tissues to stress or kill them. That said, the additives we all use only need to be as pure as what the rest of our best practices support. In fact, if we do everything else right, the additive can be fairly dirty and not matter at all. It only becomes an issue when we ignore the challenges or combine multiple missteps together. Most of our additives use elements which are mined out of the ground, with a few derived from the sea. They'll all have impurities from the geological source and only be refined down as much as the application requires or the retail price can support. But I will say in our testing, price was not a good indicator of quality at all. The most expensive options did not perform the best. A while back, we ICP MS tested calcium and alkalinity additives for impurities, four aquarium and two DIY options, and found grossly different levels of heavy metals, copper, and other impurities in them. None were perfect. Well, any impurity sounds bad. To give you an idea how much they matter, you have to do some math. For instance, when we ICB MS tested six calcium chloride sources, one of the most popular and expensive options had zinc as high as 0.6 parts per million. It's six times higher than the 0.1 that resulted in 62% growth reduction in loss of chlorophyll A in Silophora, reported in a study shared in the last episode. So that 0.6 sounds bad, but you gotta remember that you may only dose 100 milliliters of that to a 400 liter tank. So that dose that contains 0.6 parts per million zinc is diluted in the tank by a factor of 4,000 and completely in material today. It would take 4,000 days or doses to get to that 0.6. However, it would only take just shy of 700 days or two years to get to that 0.1 level that produced 62% loss growth and loss of chlorophyll A. You might see what we're talking about now with the cumulative effects that happen in two years and why they're worth considering. The question, of course, is if this is true, why are tanks not dropping left and right at two years? The answer is some tanks, or at least more sensitive corals, probably are, but nobody would pin the cause on something that we've been dosing for two years successfully, at least not without the type of knowledge that we're discussing today. However, the biggest answer is water changes. Any reasonable water change schedule makes all of this a moot point, and the zinc would never accumulate because we remove most of the zinc polluted water and replenish it with fresh seawater with a near complete tank turnover once or a few times a year, circumventing this problem entirely. That said, there are options we tested with more or less zinc, ranging from zero to as high as one part per million, so this is where you can use this information to your advantage. If you know that you're doing fewer water changes than most reefers, then selecting an additive option with closer to zero pollutive elements, or effectively more pure, is obviously better, and won't accumulate in the tank in the same way. This becomes even more clear why preventative water changes or dilution has higher success rates than reactionary strategies based on testing or visual assessment when you consider other elements, like two parts per million aluminum, 0.5 arsenic, 0.9 copper, 192 parts per million heavy metals, or 0.5 parts per million lithium. 
Well, that of course all sounds bad, but if you performed the 35% monthly, 10% weekly, or 1.5% daily water changes, it's unlikely that even this will be a major problem, as a vast majority of those elemental pollutants are exported from the tank via dilution. That said, if for whatever reason regular water changes are just not on the table for you, find one of the higher quality two parts. A visual assessment will rule out many for me, while visual clarity is no guarantee, all of the calcium additives that we've tested and mixed up visually dirty or brown or pink tints tend to also have the most and highest levels of contaminants. I personally wouldn't use anything that looks visually dirty when dissolved. If I can see them with the naked eye, it's enough. This is fairly rare, but if there's a stated grade on the container, consider it. A grade isn't a guarantee of suitability for application of reefing and supporting coral, but my experience is tech grade has a higher risk factor for pollutants. Food grade is normally as good or better than many aquarium products. USP or pharmaceutical grade better than most aquarium products. Consider ICP testing. In this case, I don't mean ICP testing all the additives. I mean ICP test your tank periodically and see what's happening every quarter or even once or twice a year in your tank. Get a deeper understanding of the chemistry trends in the tank. The reason I suggest not spending a fortune in testing all the additives against each other is it rapidly becomes irrelevant. The contaminants in the ground source minerals change as the mine moves around, the manufacturers change the sources entirely. In fact, after that round of ICP MS testing five years ago, we were disappointed that Brightwell came in first on the magnesium and BRS second. Good on Brightwell, but it also required changes from our supplier for us to up the game. Fact is, changes happen all the time, and the data like this needs to be repeated. Actual ICP test results in the tank is likely the most valuable testing point, and why many of the methods that suggest fewer water changes also couple that with ICP testing to tell you when to do those changes. The other factor is it's somewhat hard to identify when ICP testing additives, what's an intended trace element between some of them, and what is an impurity. This brings us to the next elemental pollution consideration the methodology used by each manufacturer on what major, minor, and trace elements to include in the formulation of the additive and at what level. It's a fact we would all like to believe that when an additive says includes all major, minor, and trace elements that it's perfect and uptake perfectly matches replenishment. That of course is impossible and the additive producers will be the first to acknowledge that. A major, minor, and trace element additive cannot and never will be perfectly matched to our systems. Formulating an additive system where major, minor, and trace elements are all in balance with uptake is more a game of averages than precision. Here's the challenge. Corals uptake trace elements, iodine, fluorine, bromine, lithium, vanadium, molybdenum, strontium, barium, ion, manganese, copper, nickel, chrome, cobalt, boron, and a laundry list of other elements. Some used for the production of skeleton, some utilized for cellular or metabolic functions within the coral's tissue or utilized by the zooxanthellae. So it seemed like replacing these elements is wise, and it probably is but there's a pollutionary risk when it goes wrong. That's because every single coral calcifying and non-calcifying organism, including various algae, are going to uptake many of these elements differently. The same corals may even do it differently if moved to a new tank with different environmental parameters. There's no way to thread the needle here and make an additive system that addresses all organisms in all tanks perfectly. The goal is always to just get close, but we can account for the realities of imperfection. What happens when the one-size-fits-all approach to elements results in too much of a good thing? Corals are not utilizing some of these elements as fast as they're being added, and they start rising beyond beneficial levels. This is when trace elements fit that definition of pollution, a substance that is harmful or poisonous effects in sufficient quantities. The net effect of this is the same as the impurity conversation. A single dose of a less than perfectly formulated two-part will never be an issue, likely not even a hundred. It's the unmitigated hundreds to several hundreds over a year or two that build up. Basically, all of the additive systems out there are designed around and expect or require some amount of dilution or water changes to account for the otherwise inevitable drifts. The biggest difference amongst them is size, frequency, or if the water changes are designed to prevent chemistry challenges or catch them with testing and then react to them after the fact. Okay, so again, acknowledging this is a high probability challenge, why isn't it a bigger issue for reefers? First, it's very likely that many reefers have experienced stress corals or even mortalities related to overdosing trace elements, but have not accurately diagnosed that as the cause. That'd be a pretty advanced move. Second reason is very few reefers use ICP testing to identify trends, even if it was only once a year, to see the results of a year's efforts, where it landed, and how it was different. Most of the contaminants the ICP test kit will show related to food, tap water, and additive inputs throughout the year. The big question in all this is who has the best approach to formulating trace elements in their additives? We'll have a full video on all the popular approaches in the future, but for this video, I'll share this is one of the reasons why we're running Triton Core 7 on the tanks in 52SE. 
Most of the added producers have shared with me why they believe their additive is the best. There is a bit of a trust leap, but while most are different, they all seem to be fairly logical. However, there is one mentality or approach that stuck out from the pack for me. Triton CEO told me the reason that he knows theirs is formulated better than others is because they're not just an additive company, but also a testing company. What's unique about them is their customers who use the Core 7 send in hundreds of thousands of ICP test kits, which includes data on exactly how well the additive as well as others are working on the tank. When anomalies arise, they can reach out for clarifying questions. This provides the opportunity for data back continual performance improvements and threading the needle of working the best for not everyone, but for the absolute most people. How much this helps is a reasonable question, but it was a mentality that resonated with me as having the highest degree of success or likelihood of anything I'd heard to date. Support of that Core 7 workout great on the BRS 360 for us. Core 7 formula addresses the fact that all these tanks utilize elements differently than the average tank because they have refugiums. In the end, logic, personal experience, and testing land on what I believe to be best for these tanks. For those of you that don't have a fuge, they do have in other methods. However, for anyone who understands the full Triton system already, there's an obvious question. Isn't the Triton method founded upon minimal water changes, only performing them when regular ICP testing suggests the need and then dosing some individual elements when the report suggests it? The answer is yes, and if this is your first attempt with something new, I'd suggest following that recipe as close as you can and see what it produces. We did that with the BRS360 for a long time and it worked great, as long as we sent in those kits and did what the report said. However, not surprising, on a test-based reactionary system, if we didn't send in the kits or dose what it said, the tank went south. There's a method to the madness and it worked. However, once you've made a few cakes, you can change things with predictable results. In the end, while well, the testing and little bottles was fun, it was too mad scientist for me and was more work than just doing the regular preventative water changes. After a while, we switched things up, kept the Core 7, but moved to regular water change schedule and stopped most of the individual bottle dosing. Net result is some elements were slightly depleted, but nothing material or seemed to affect success. We also never had toxic or elevated elements from the additive. The tank thrived off the consistency of Core 7 coupled with our regular water changes. Sometimes the best results come from adapting the tools to your needs or situation, but knowing how that tool works first produced the best results. There's another challenge with elements, not calcium hydroxide or calcium formate or even calcium reactor, but with all two parts. That's pollutive levels of sodium chloride. This one's unavoidable. Salinity will rise using two-part. It can happen faster than most people think, and the corrective solutions can have unintended consequences. You guessed it. Water change is the best solution, but in this case, consider how much two-part you use. I'll show you a couple of graphs to demonstrate this in a second. The reason why two-parts raise salinity is they're all based on salt. The calcium portion based on calcium chloride, the alkalinity portion based on sodium carbonate or bicarbonate. Once dosed in the tank, the carbonate alkalinity ionizes into the water and leaves the sodium behind. The calcium ionizes into the water and leaves the chloride behind, effectively polluting the tank with excess sodium chloride or table salt in the tank that will raise the salinity. There are not any studies on sodium chloride only elevated salinity on corals, but there are many on general salinity increases like this one. The effects of temperature and salinity on growth, metabolism, and digestive enzyme synthesis of Ganiopora. The Ganiopora could survive in a wide salinity range of 25 to 40 parts per thousand. However, the maximum number and weight of the Ganiopora polyps was determined at 30 to 35 parts per thousand. Furthermore, the 30 to 35 parts per thousand salinity at 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit led to the best Ganiopora growth and survival, mainly because of their enhanced nutrient absorption rate, polyp expansion rate, metabolic rate, and adaptability. Their chart demonstrates this pretty convincingly. After eight weeks, the protein composition of the coral was much lower at 40 parts per thousand salinity than 35 that most reefers maintain. And the fat content dramatically lower at the elevated salinity as well. Salinity clearly played a big role in this experiment. Survival, not the primary measurement, but how these environmental changes stress the animals. So how does this tie back to two part? Well, every gallon of many popular two parts have around two cups of salt dissolved in them. So when you finish a gallon of each, you've effectively added four cups of salt to the tank, more when the magnesium included as well. There is a lot of chloride and sulfate in magnesium portions. Ray Holmes Farley's article called an improved do-it-yourself two-part calcium and alkalinity supplement system demonstrates this effect over time with the addition of dosing 1.1 dKH a day to the tank and matching amount of calcium and alkalinity. After one year with no water changes, the salinity rises 32%. That'd be a salinity of 47 parts per thousand or about one point of dKH per month. Again, not the kind of pollutionary problem that shows up in a single dose or even a month of doses. Considering the study that we just mentioned, it might show up as we approach five months, but not in mortality. 
but in harder to define decreases in health and stress. The two-part article does demonstrate the effect of water changes on the sulfate portion of the article's recipes once water changes are considered. Where zero water changes has the expected perpetual rise to nowhere good, 7.5 to 15% monthly slows the progression, and 30% monthly changes has a small rise and then stabilizes. This is the reason why most two-part manufacturers fully expect you to perform water changes, 30% a month looking like an effective number here. This does bring up the question, alternatively to water changes, if the tank has risen a few points of salinity to say 38.5 parts per thousand, why not just manually dilute the tank by taking some of the salt water out of the tank and replacing it with fresh water? That would effectively lower the salinity 10% back down to the standard 35 parts per thousand, but it also lower everything else along with it. Alkalinity from 9 to 8.1, 420 calcium will drop to 378, and 1300 magnesium to 1170. They all need to be then corrected back up by adding more salt to the tank. This of course has cascading effects on all the other major and minor and trace elements that we don't commonly test for, which is a bit mad scientist for me. At this point, it's probably clear why the sodium chloride and resulting elevated salinity from two parts is considered a polluting element in the tank. It certainly meets the definition of pollution, a substance that has harmful or poisonous effects in sufficient quantities, and why most additive manufacturers rely on us to perform a reasonable water change schedule to dilute that challenge and make it a moot point. However, there are caveats to every rule. Some two parts account for the excess sodium chloride in their formulation and much better options for those who choose to do fewer water changes. Tropic Marin's balling method and Triton's method and Core 7 come to mind. Tropic Marin's balling method addresses the sodium chloride problem this way. They know that they're adding in calcium, alkalinity, and sodium chloride every single day. Salinity will rise. We'll have to take out some salt water and dilute the tank, which at which point every major minor trace elements will drop along with that. An ongoing problem that just gets worse with every time that you do it. So when the Bali method was designed, they added a Part C. Part C is everything that's in the aquarium salt mix, but they leave out the sodium chloride because the sodium and chloride are in their Part A and B two part. Now when the tank goes up 3% or one part per thousand salinity, it's not just the sodium chloride that went up 3%, every material element also went up 3%. So when you dilute the tank back down, they all go down evenly and maintain balanced levels. Now it's very likely that in a minimal water change environment, that acknowledgement and addressing this challenge has a very material effect on the 12 to 36 month results of a reef tank. However, in a more aggressive water change environment where the imbalanced water is removed and replaced with balanced water consistently, it's debatable how valuable the Part C or sodium chloride free sea salt is. At this point, many reefers are probably thinking, I've never had to manually dilute my tank by removing salt and replacing it with fresh water, or at least that's pretty rare. Good chance that's because your water changes are enough to prevent the need for that but even more likely you're diluting and didn't even know it via your protein skimmer. If your skimmer pulls out a cup and a half of effectively really dirty seawater each day, your auto top off is going to replace it and dilute the tank for you. In a month, a cup and a half a day of skimmate removal is roughly three gallons of salt water removed and replaced with fresh water or 3% dilution in a 100 gallon tank and enough to account for the excess sodium chloride addition from two parts of many tanks. A high functioning skimmer can serve a wide variety of uses. Another multi-part that accounts for the excess sodium chloride in its formulation so it isn't an issue is Triton's Core 7. Rather than use a sodium chloride-free Part C like Tropic Marin, they've told me that the Core 7 counts on wet skimmate for dilution and the four-part additive contains the right amount of additives to acknowledge and account for the necessary dilution from the skimmer and ATO. This makes sense because the Triton method is built upon doing test result reactionary water changes rather than proactive or preventative water changes, so accounting for the excess sodium chloride in their formulation is a necessity. With all this discussion and reliance on water changes, it begs the question, is a salt mix a source of pollution as well? It might seem like the quality of salt mix is mission critical, and it certainly is a hotly debated topic in reefing. But in relation to today's topic, will a bad salt mix pollute the tank? Will a good one avoid that? If dilution or water changes is such a useful tool, is what salt mix I use a major factor in that effectiveness? Quick answer is don't spend a lot of time worrying about what salt mix to use. Some are certainly better than others, but most are all what I'd classify as good enough from a contaminant perspective. That's the answer 80% of the time, but there's always a bigger picture worth contemplating. The primary reason we suggest that which salt you use isn't a huge concern in relation to today's topic of pollution or contaminants is this. If a salt is good enough to start a tank or fill it 100% with, meaning all of the salt water in the tank was produced using that salt, then a small periodic water change or dilution with itself is typically not going to pollute the tank to a major degree. 
Diluting something with itself is a neutral move. If a less than ideal salt mix contained an undesirable level of lithium, boron, or some other element, a water change of water with water made from the same salt mix will presumably have the same level as that contaminant and won't elevate, reduce, or dilute it no matter how much water you change. However, this is one of the reasons why picking a brand of salt you believe in and sticking with it is wise. These are the 20% caveats that where a less than ideal salt can make things worse. One is the bioaccumulation in living tissue. Super common to ICP test the tank and find that there's no elevated toxins, but the corals don't look good. One of the common reasons is because those toxins have actually been removed by the coral and now in its tissue where it's causing the problem. This takes a while to develop and it isn't an easy problem to fix. Way better to just reduce the undesirable sources of introduction. In this case, this is why ICP testing the freshly mixed salt water is a better way to identify the quality of the salt mix than testing the tank itself. If you did ICP test all the salts, you'll find that none of them emulate natural seawater exactly. It's just an impracticality. Most will have at least one questionable element level, but none should have what is considered actually toxic. I do not believe what salt you select will make or break your tank, but some salts are absolutely better than others. It would be odd if that wasn't the case. They don't all follow the same exact recipe or formula. They don't all use the same raw materials. There is actually a strong financial pressure to use raw materials that are found in your home country, or at least nearby, which are all various degrees of quality. In fact, not necessarily good or bad, but the biggest difference will often be between US-made salts like Instant Ocean and Brightwell and European salts like HW, Aquaforce, and Nios, just due to being other sides of the planet and where they get the raw materials from. ICP testing is realistically the best solution for the average reefer who wants to make an informed decision about the quality of both the formula used to create the salt and the impurities, intentional or an unintentional. However, you're not going to test for them all. That's just too expensive. The right salt is realistically going to be a mix of research, referrals, results, and a belief that a supplier has the capability of delivering on their claims. ICP, an optional confirmation of those results and a window into why it works or doesn't. For those of you who want to know, historically the two salts that we've used the most in the tanks here at BRS are HW Marine Mixed Reefer and Tropic Marine Pro Reef. HW was predominantly based on positive reports and referrals and the results we had using it. The Pro Reef based on a series of experiments and BRS TV Investigates episodes we did back in 2019. Results and testing, equally valuable in four methods of picking a salt. It's likely we'll repeat a couple of those salt tests for 52SC's salt mixing and water change episode to see what's changed and add in a few entries like Aquaforest and Nios. Nios in particular is interesting because I was told they designed the salt specifically to beat our tests. I feel like I need to take that bait. Another reason to retest them is simply that was five years ago. Manufacturers and all their suppliers make changes all the time. I anticipate similar results as last time, but there's only one way to know, and that's keep that data up to date. The only other caveat where a salt mix could be a major pollutant contributor is the bad batch, meaning some element or toxin was grossly elevated in the salt and hitting that definition of pollution where it has harmful or poisonous effects on the tank. I share this because toxins in salt mixes or bad batches are something that's often a topic of concern when reefers run into issues with their tanks, but I bet only one out of every 10,000 times that it's brought up, it ends up being the actual true cause. However, unmitigated pollutants from foods, tap water, and additives are accumulative challenges in 100% of tanks. The reason salt mixes are often brought up instead is it's human nature to look at something I did recently as the cause. Water changes are often inherently recently. Dosing two-part and feeding food is also inherently recent, but so frequent and prolonged that it seems impossible. Frankly, it takes a considerable amount of knowledge and application of that knowledge to consider the accumulative effects of something we started dosing daily 12 to 18 months ago. On top of that, feeding or a single dose of two parts is what I'd characterize as a low stress event. But even with ideal water, changing that water, temperature, air exposure, pH, disturbed sand, or other cleaning events or medias change during a water change is a stress event. One that healthy corals skip over without a beat but may push already stressed corals over the edge. That said, they do happen from time to time, and we will dive deeper into the bad batch topic in our salt mix or making artificial seawater episode of 52SE, but my experience is most of these events are just the result of not mixing the salt long enough at the factory to get all the elements or individual salt grains homogeneously mixed. If it isn't adequately mixed, some elements end up in the elevated or deficient pockets. Good news is this will typically show up with a hobby grade calcium, alkalinity, or magnesium test kit, so you can test for it at home. I'd consider it wise to nearly mandatory to test the first batch of salt made from every box, at least alkalinity, which is the easiest. 
Once the accuracy of the test kit, testing procedure, and reasonable expectations for the salt are considered, being within 10% of what's stated on the box is a reasonable expectation. If bad batches are something that keeps you up at night, some reefers will ICP test the first batch of salt from every new box for peace of mind. That seems a bit aggressive to me, but a way to get similar levels of confidence at a lower cost is next time your preferred salt is on sale, pick up a year or two's worth of salt at a time. Salt has a high probability of being from the same manufacturing run using the same raw materials. ICP test the first batch of salt water you mix up and know for sure that you're good. The savings from buying salt pays for the ICP, and if you only did this every two years, you would only have to do it five times in a decade. But know that you're now part of a group that will never worry about the quality or safety of their salt mix on a whole variety of fronts. However, next is something that ICP is not great for, pollutants from hands and the surrounding air. We all know this one, but we don't all respect it. Anything that comes in contact with the marine tank is going to leave something in the tank. This includes everything on your hands and arms, fragrances, soaps, lotions, petroleum products, or anything that you've been doing or handling recently. Weeding or fertilizing the garden, oil change on the mower, sanitizing the tub, emptying the dishwasher, cleaning the windows, the list is endless. The challenge is there's no test kit for these things. ICP doesn't tell you about the soap or weed killer or lotion, at least not directly. Best practices wear arm link gloves. Disposable veterinary gloves a good option. And avoid introduction altogether. If not that, then do your best to clean your hands and arms before they go into the tank and let it be as infrequent as possible. Alternatively, the proactive option that just kind of owns that hands will be going in the tank is the use of a few bucks of carbon, which is effective on many of these organic contaminants. Outside of that, and not surprising, I'm sure, water changes the dilutive force that makes sure what are nearly inevitable missteps for many reefers just don't build up in the tank and the pollutants are eventually exported rather than building. Aerosolized pollution and gases are a bit more complex. Anything in the air will be introduced to the tank through surface turnover on the top of the tank as well as through the skimmer, sucking that air in and whisking it together with the tank. Most reefers know not to use something like Windex or 409 on or around the tank, but that has to be communicated to the entire household. However, I also avoid home air fresheners or really anything that sprays chemical particles into the air and distributed throughout the house via the HVAC system. Some reefers draw the air from outside the house for their skimmer. If you do that, make sure to never spray lawn or garden products near that input or leave the lawnmower running near the intake or put the skimmer intake near a laundry exhaust. A small amount of activated carbon, a good backup for when missteps are made, water changes that dilutive force that avoids all but the most gross ongoing missteps. The one air pollutant that most reefers are aware of, but the hobby really hasn't embraced solving yet, is carbon dioxide poisoning. Most homes tend to build up excess toxic carbon dioxide from people and pets breathing. Most, however, don't consider CO2 to be a pollutant in their homes or tanks, but when the high CO2 gets into the tank, it creates carbonic acid, which prevents the corals from calcifying properly, inhibits growth, creates porous, brittle skeleton, and stresses the animals. That combo certainly meets the pollutionary standard of a substance that has harmful or poisonous effects. If your pH is commonly below eight, this is likely you. Best way is to open up the windows for a few hours, let some fresh air in and see what the effect is on your pH. You might be surprised by how much it goes up. If that's not realistic based on the season, throw a CO2 scrubber on your skimmer's air intake line and you'll be clear within hours if this is a problem we're solving. We've done Beers TV Investigates on the effects of low pH with dramatic growth and health differences, and there are countless studies we'll explore in a full pH episode. But we want to share it here as well because it may open up some thought processes as we consider how gases like CO2 in the room find their way into the tank and affect the health of the animals. The highlight of that video is an air exchanger on your home is a solution. Maybe a number of plants in the home will reduce CO2 in the air. Lower surface turnover and a skimmer that draws air from outside or from a CO2 scrubber and reducing less and maybe even pulling CO2 out of the tank. Two-part and Kelquas are soaking up excess CO2 up, and my favorite because it's the simplest, cheapest, and least invasive, a healthy refugium will soak up the excess CO2 as well. We'll have a 52 SC episode on refugiums and pH as well. Next pollutive challenge, old gear, rust, exploding magnets, and the like. What to do about all that? We're asked all the time about things like my magnet cleaner exploded in the tank, heater cracked or exploded, plastic gear melted, seals and pumps failed. Does the plastic itself leach over time? Not directly related, but similar effect, small hands drop some coins or something else undesirable into the tank. 
I don't have an answer to if plastics leach anything harmful over the years. Water is the universal solvent, so it's possible on a long enough timeline, but also much more likely with low-grade gear and plastics. Both likely a moot point with any reasonable water change schedule. The rest of those major equipment failures can result in what I'd describe as a catastrophic pollutant, the type of thing where the tank can have hours to days from the event before it's a total crash. The best option here is preventative as well. That's biannual maintenance. Set the gear up in a manner where it can be easily removed and run in a bucket of citric acid. Powerheads, heaters, and returns can often be done right at the tank with a bucket next to it, even without messing with the cords. What that does is twofold. Well cared for gear that's not caked in precipitate and coralline, working into the seals and bearings is much less likely to wear, leak, or break catastrophically. Second, it's a natural inspection point. If you see something suspect, it's time to replace the gear, not try to squeak a few more months out of it. Those who prevent these types of events have 100x the types of success rates of those who try to catch it in real time and react to them. No one wants to have to buy a replacement powerhead, return, or heater, but we all want crashes less, and the fact is that everything that's running 24-7, submerged in corrosive seawater, has a usable life. What about despite best practices, something major still likely goes wrong? Particularly if I can visually see immediate negative effects in the corals, I would change out as much of the water as I can, as close to 100% as possible. Larger changes if the problem is presenting as aggressive. One of the biggest challenges beyond the fact that a 75 gallon per day RODI might not produce water fast enough for that is heating that water can be slow and temperature is important to match to somewhat close to the tank on bigger water changes. Search for and use Hams's effect on water changes calculator to understand the effects of what you're doing and what's left in the tank. For less aggressive instances, 35% changes is a more reasonable size for most people to produce, heat quickly, and less likely to cause a combined stress event. But it also take five of them to effectively dilute or remove around 90% of the contaminants in the tank. Sometimes water changes are also just not an option. This is commonly true on big tanks where few reefers have hundreds of gallons on hand. In that case, if carbon and GFO is what you have on hand, it's worth trying, but they're a low probability save. Many people swear by the polyfilter brand pads which have a resin coating on them to absorb metals. Polyfilters are inexpensive and can probably be found at a local fish store around you when needed. However, what I'd really suggest as an emergency tool when water changes are not an option is a resin-based filter media like Purit from Brightwell Marine. This is designed for metals and catastrophic events like these. Running the Purit in a reactor forces virtually all of the tank's water through it multiple times an hour. I'd even go as far as to say having a canister of Purit around with the in the event of emergency break glass label because when you need it, you need it now. Alternatively, ask your favorite local fish store to stock it. At least it's there when you need it. Now that we've made the case and you've heard it, do you all agree with our council? That the solution for pollution in 80% of tanks is select a clean additive system that addresses these issues, clean your pumps and gear biannually, do your 35% monthly, 10% weekly, or 1.5% daily water changes, run either carbon or ozone on a resin like Purit in the event of emergency. If not, what do you recommend to other reefers or use yourself? Next episode of 52 SE, we start a deep dive into each segment of filtration, starting with an entire episode on protein skimming. Everything that we've learned in the last decade, nearly all of us have one or have had a skimmer, but it's one of the most poorly understood filters on the tank. Let's change that. This release and the entire 52 SE guide to reefing right here.